When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he comes upon him and overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoils. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. So Lord, we thank you that you are the one who is stronger than the strong man. The devil has been defeated. Death has been defeated. He tries to hold on to our stuff, but you said no, because you are stronger than the strong man. You come in and you overtake him, and you, when you overcome him, you take from him all the armor in which he trusted, and you divide the spoils with us. So we have our arms open to receive all the spoils that you want to divide with us, and we receive that promise that you are stronger than the strong man today in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. So um, hopefully this will be a, a nourishing meal for you because it really was for me. And, you know, it's just so good to go back and give thanks to the Lord for everything he's done for you. And after you've been a Christian a long time, you don't always think to, to give thanks for basic things because it's easy to take things for granted. But if you've been delivered from an addiction like smoking cigarettes and, you know, so many things that the enemy uses to kill people, uh, if you've been delivered from that by the Lord, it's so good to just keep reminding yourself, without him, where would I be? If it had not been for the Lord on my side, where would I be? And, you know, the context of this little portion, these are just three verses from Luke 11. But Jesus was doing miracles, and the Pharisees were really challenged by that. You would have thought they would have been happy to see people getting free. But they couldn't process the fact that he didn't have the standing, the academic standing and all the training. He was a blue-collar guy. He was, he was a carpenter. And yet he was operating in miracles. And, and it says, you know, there's this telling phrase earlier in this chapter that I didn't put on here. But you probably know the Bible well enough to know. It says that he was casting out a demon and it was mute. Okay? And he cast out the demon and the man spoke. So that was a difficult thing for the Pharisees and the religious people because it was a physical problem that had a spiritual root. So there's another portion of scripture in Matthew that I talked about a couple of weeks ago where Jesus uh, is talking to the apostles and they're a little confused and they're saying, why do you keep talking in parables all the time? It's confusing. Wouldn't it be easier to just say what you want to say? And he said, no, it's been given to you to know. Do you remember this? It's been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Okay, now they're apostles and I mean, they're, they're blue collar people as well. And in another portion of Matthew, it says he's talking to the Pharisees and it says the tax collectors and the prostitutes are getting into the kingdom ahead of you. Yeah. Wow. That's like not the soft little pleasant Jesus that everybody pictures. And why would that be? Because religion can close your vision off and give you a hardened heart. And all of a sudden now, if, if Jesus couldn't fit in their box, the conclusion they came to in Luke 11 is, oh, well, he cast out that mute devil, but it's by the devil he cast out the devil. And Jesus was like, just think about common sense here for a minute, guys. Like, that doesn't even make sense. No kingdom divided against itself can stand. If the devil casts out the devil, that's not his mission. He's not going to cast himself out. But if I cast out a demon with the finger of God, I have a feeling it was just a little pinky finger, just a little pinky finger of God. His power is so much stronger. And that's what it says. Look, the strong man, I could just picture like this big dude, strong man with his arms up and holding you or me captive in that addiction. In my case, I keep talking about that because that was the one that's most obvious to me. And the one that was just so life-destroying, it was going to kill me if, if I didn't stop. And I tried everything and nothing worked, which is really a frustrating. That makes you more depressed and that makes you use drugs even more. So I was really spiraling, badly spiraling down. And if the Lord hadn't come in, I don't think I'd still be alive. And I was not only, it wasn't just the drugs, it's the behavior that being high led to the stupid things that I was doing that many people have been killed for what I was doing. You could read about it. And it was just the grace of God that spared me. Okay, so here's this thing that happens. And this man that couldn't speak miraculously can speak. 
And religion says, no, that's the devil. You see, you see how dangerous religious thinking can be. It's rigor mortis. It's dead. It's stiff. And nothing live can go in there because it's already decided that can't be God because it doesn't fit in my little box. And Jesus is talking to these blue-collar guys and said, to you has been given to know, know the mysteries of the kingdom. And to the Pharisees, it says, the tax collectors and the harlots are getting in ahead of you. Really big warning, isn't it? And that's how I think we should look at our lives, that we are not just here to fill a pew until Jesus comes back. That we have a mission and we have a call in our lives and every one of us is different. But we should find out what it is and we should try to flourish in that specific call that he has on each one of us. Now, what's really cool to me is this, uh, this analogy of uh, Jesus being stronger than the strong man. Anybody heard of the screw tape letters? Okay, and it's a little bit of a hard read. C.S. Lewis in general is a little bit of a hard read. Um, but this particular one that I have up here right now is a dramatized audio version. So it's like listening to those old radio shows where you could hear the train in the background if the scene had a train. So this has actors acting out C.S. Lewis screw tape letters, and it's really effective. And this is what C.S. Lewis was writing to his brother about what he was thinking about at the time about this book. He said, I, it would be called as one devil to another. <laughs> That was the original title. And it would consist of letters from an elderly retired devil to a young devil who has just started to work on his first patient. <laughs> the idea would be to give all the psychology of temptation from the other point of view. And it does. And you want to know what the devil is trusting in. It says in the, in the message, I'm sorry, not the message, in the um, Passion Translation, which you hear me talk about a lot. Let's just look at it. Look at that same verse that we use through the Passion for a minute. It says, Satan belongings are undisturbed, and he stands guard over his fortress kingdom, strong and fully armed with an arsenal of many weapons. Boy, that changes it, doesn't it? He's got not just fully armed, but this says there's a fortress kingdom that the enemy was holding over me, and he had a whole arsenal of weapons that he used against me. And what Screwtape's Letters does is show you what some of those weapons are in his arsenal of how he gets us to believe lies. Because the truth sets you free, so if he can get you to believe a lie, you won't get free from the truth. Or he allows... Well, look, all of us, uh, in one way or another, have suffered some harsh, harsh treatment in our lives, I would guess, right? Very few people just get this smooth ride. And frankly, if you've had a smooth ride, you're, you're susceptible to getting taken advantage of because there's some form of needing to understand about contending to make it in the world or else you'll be taken advantage of, right? Jesus wasn't just this little flower. I mean, he flipped over the tables. When it was time to take authority over something, he did it. So we have to just reframe our thinking a little bit here, right? So what? think about it. What are some of the offenses that the enemy would use against us? What are some of the tools and weapons in his arsenal? I just wrote down a couple. And, and the first thing that I've said many times recently is that he wants to normalize sin in the culture. Because if he can normalize sin in the culture, then you being a Christian trying to take a stand, you look like the bad guy. If they can turn what is evil into good... Then, and you're just saying, no, I know, I trust the Lord. I'm reading the word of God, and I know that the thing that you're calling good is evil in God's eyes. So that's one of his main strategies. We live in a democracy, and if the law passes, we have to follow the law. But you could be a, a person who says, look, I don't agree with abortion. I'm not going to have an abortion, you could say. But that doesn't mean that other people can't because it's legal. I don't like it that it's legal, but I live in America, and I'm not moving to Russia. As bad as, you know, some things about America might be, it's still the greatest country. So it's why we need to think about elections and why we need to be thinking about getting engaged and involved in knowing what we believe because there's other things that they talked about, and I don't want to go there, but just so you know, the next year is going to be very heated around these things, and you have to be engaged with it, even though it feels a little slimy, doesn't it? The way people treat each other, the way they talk to each other, we have to rise above that and realize... This really important, this next election, whatever, they're all important. 